How many moms in the room have a lot on their plate? <laughs> like that's a good message right there. And uh, most of us don't realize how much and how much there really is to do until she's not there. She's, uh, she's mom's got a sick day. She's got a day off. And oh my gosh, who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? And Mark's right that dad has no clue. Uh, that is the truth. Um, if you would like uh, to get a good laugh sometime, you might listen to Jill and I talk about raising our children, especially when they were that age, when they were littles, because it sounds like two different lives completely. <laughs> uh, Jill uses the word uh, clueless, and um, I am thankful for uh, all moms, I'm thankful for my mom. I told the story earlier of all the things my mom tried to get, uh, and I wanted her to teach me how to cook. She made great fat hamburgers in an iron skillet. She made great spaghetti. I can't get those right. The only thing I can get right is the grits. And the reason that happens is, all you got to remember is, more butter, more sugar. <laughs> oh, excuse me, more butter, more salt. More butter, more salt. And yeah, I get that right. So I'm thankful for uh, Jill. Uh, the reason our kids are successful is because of their mom, and uh, that's very evident if you know my kids. And I'm thankful for Krista and Amanda and JC now doing the same thing all over again. And I'm sure you are too, and that's part of what we're here for today. We're going to look at, Mar at Luke chapter uh, 7, and in this passage, this is a difficult situation. I hope... Um, you uh, never find yourself in this situation, but uh, some of you have. Uh, it is supposed to go that um, moms and dads uh, who have children raise those children and uh, go through the hard years of diapers and no sleeping and wet the bed, and then you get to the ages where they are starting school, and then they fight with their siblings, and then you get to the teen, preteen years, and years and then they start driving and then the, you know the whole goal is to get them out of your house they become responsible adults and um, then it comes back around that eventually uh, maybe the Lord blesses you with grandkids that's the season we're in with nine littles uh, that's wonderful and then if everything goes like it's supposed to go you get old and your children then take care of you, and it, you know you change their diapers, and then they change, <laughs> then they help you, and and then you know, grandpa gets this age, and grandma gets this this age, and we go to glory, and everybody has the good and bad memories, but just like childbirth, I think the good ones outweigh the bad ones, and you forget some of the bad things. But then there's times where it doesn't go like it's supposed to. That life doesn't go like it's supposed to. A parent shouldn't have to bury their child. It's not supposed to go like that, you know? And that's what's happening in the story that we're going to read today. And Jesus is right in the middle of it. This is an amazing story out of Luke chapter 7. And I will tell you, this is an amazing passage as far as... Uh, expressing the gospel to somebody this is the gospel story and so you know if you ever uh in your circle of friends the people that get you to know and you know maybe some of them are believers and some of them are not um if it ever comes up about tell me about the, what's this all about i've heard about jesus i've heard about religion i've known religious people i've known churches i just it just never clicked this is one of the stories that you can tell because the gospel is right in the middle of it so in this message entitled, But There's a Resurrection Coming, let's read uh, Luke chapter 7, uh, starting at verse 11. Now, we're going to take it one verse at a time, instead of reading the whole thing. I think you know the story, but I'm going to build it as we go and get to the end of it. So we're starting at verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called... Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. Okay? So, if you're reading the Bible and you're going to take it in context, 
uh, it is good to know, uh, as Luke writes for us, soon afterward. There's a reason he put that in there. Because this story is connected to the previous story. In that previous story, a Roman centurion hears about Jesus, and he has a servant that's dying. And so he sends some Jewish leaders uh, to Jesus to tell the story and ask if Jesus would come and heal this servant. But then in the story, he says, wait a minute, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof, Jesus. All you have to do is say the word, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus expresses something pretty amazing, actually. He says, I have not seen great faith like this anywhere in Israel. So he's not talking about a Hebrew. He's not talking about an Israelite, a, a Jew. He's talking about a Roman, a Greek, who, who in that culture had hundreds of gods. Okay? He's talking about a, a, a Gentile, a non-believer, and he says of this man, you have the greatest faith I've ever seen. And so Jesus healed him, the, the man's servant. Okay? When that happened, this is the only place in the Bible, when this man said this, where it's recorded that Jesus was amazed. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. So that's the story that preceded this. Soon after that, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd with him. So picture this, okay? He's walking, and actually, we were in this area uh, when we were in Israel. Nain is a little town uh, south and southwest of Bethlehem. So we were on the outskirts of Jerusalem. You can't go to Bethlehem now. It's too dangerous for tourists to go there. But we could see it. And then just past that, there would have been another little village. And if you look in a Bible atlas, you can see where it was. So they have been up north, and then they travel here, and uh, a disciple, so there's 12, plus a large crowd were with him. So it's this group of people, and they're headed toward this town. In, in this town, uh, we find in the next verse, there is tragedy. Okay? Um, as he approached... There was a funeral procession. As they approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. So the first person we see, other than the crowd, is this, this mom, who is a widow. Okay? We don't know if her husband and her son maybe have contracted the same illness, and he died a week before, or... 10 years before, or he was killed in an accident. We don't know what happened to him, but we know that she is a widow, and now she has lost her only child. Some moms bear grief, heavy grief. I mean, we all do at times. But I can't imagine what it's like and what this mom is feeling. So picture this, as they approach Nain, there are two crowds now. She was a widow. She had lost her son. Oops. And a large crowd from the town was with her. So these two groups are meeting. Jesus and the disciples are approaching Nain. This widow and a, her mourners, her family and the, some other people of the town, they're leaving the gate because you would have buried people outside the city gates. You don't bury them inside. So these two crowds are meeting, okay? This mom is grieving. This group is grieving. They may be wailing or crying as this, this, this body is being carried. This group has just seen an amazing miracle of Jesus, okay? Here's another thing. The group that Jesus is leading is, is coming from Capernaum. 
if you read it in Luke. Capernaum means city or village of comfort. Nahum is an Old Testament book, which that, that name means comfort. And so they're leaving the, the comfort and peace, and they're joyful and they're amazed because of all that's happening. That's the feeling of this group of people. This group of people is leaving the town of Nain. Nain means beauty. So they're leaving. They've turned their back to the beautiful life because they're mourning the loss of this boy. So comfort is approaching a group of mourners who are leaving beauty behind. And where they're going, they're carrying this body they're taking them outside to say, where are they going? Where, are they, where is that group heading? They're going to a cemetery of some type. They're going to a burial ground. They're, they're headed toward death. They're dealing with it. So these two groups are getting closer together. And these two groups are going to meet each other. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. We've been there. Whether it's your own child mom that has fallen off the bike and scraped up their knees and blood's running down their shins and you gather them up and you say, don't cry. Or someone has kind of gathered you up and their heart goes out to you. And maybe they don't even say anything, but you can almost feel it. They're trying to comfort you, remember? A city of comfort. That's this group of people that are meeting now, these people that are mourning. It's an amazing moment in history. What if Jesus and the disciples would have been 15 minutes later? What if the people mourning the death of this child and this woman... What if they had had the funeral an hour earlier? But this is the sovereign God of the universe. And many things in our lives come down to timing. God's perfect timing. And as she was leaving, the comfort of the Creator was approaching at just the right time. And His heart goes out to her. And he says, don't cry. Now, Jesus, of course, had an understanding about why she was not to cry. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew what was going to happen. Just like when he raised Lazarus and he told Martha and Mary, your brother will rise again. They didn't quite get it. They didn't realize it was today. You know, yeah, I understand there's a resurrection coming at the end of time. Uh, and Jesus is like, no, 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 no. You don't understand you're going to see it in a few minutes. This woman, and he says, don't cry. For whom does your heart go out? Who is it that you care greatly for that when they hurt, you hurt? Isn't that a mom's heart? When your children hurt, you'd trade places with them, wouldn't you, if you could fix it? That's a perfect, that's agape love. That is agape, what God, the Bible talks about is God's love for us. In fact, he did trade places with us. Okay? So here they are, these two groups of people meet, and watch what happens. This is shocking, in a way, because of how unorthodox it is. Then he went up and he touched the bear, the plank, it's like a wooden plank, not a casket. It's just a plank that they're carrying this, this child or young man on. Jesus is a Jew, and he's a Jewish rabbi. He's a teacher, and they would not touch anything that was dead. That makes them unclean, and they would have to go through a whole ceremony. They couldn't be around people. They couldn't touch the scripture, the scrolls in the synagogue. They couldn't go in the synagogue. So this is, this is like one of those moments where somebody does something at a social event, or, and you go, <gasps> That's what this is like. He not only walks up to this woman, not only speaks to this woman who is not a member of his family, 
And you know, that's kind of anti-cultural too. But he goes up and he puts his hand. And it shocked the people who were carrying it. They stopped. It says, Luke records, they stood still. They stopped in their tracks. This moment is historic. And he said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up, began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. This is shocking. This is amazing what's happened here. In a moment that probably can't get any more painful. There's a few of you in the room who have had to bury their own child. I can't pretend to know what that's like. But in that moment, can you imagine the swing of emotion when her son sits up, his legs swing over on the side, or the bearers set it down on the ground, and he gets up and he walks. What's the first thing his mother is going to do? Hug him. The emotion of that moment just pours over into the situation. And it's described. They are all filled with awe and praise to God. A great prophet has appeared among us. Yeah, you're getting, the, you're getting the picture. Yep, that's true. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. So here's my challenge. Moms, we, we understand you sacrifice, you know the details. You know, any husband or wife team, mom and dad team that are trying to raise their littles, uh, if you were to ask the dad, um, what do your kids eat for lunch every day? Do they eat hot lunch or do they eat, uh, take their lunch or do they, dad won't know. He will not have a clue. What size shoe does your son wear? Ah, he doesn't know. He has no clue. Um, moms know all those things. You, you go to the doctor, go to the pediatrician, and the pediatrician is talking about symptoms of why they're sick. He never looks at the dad. The dad has no clue. You know, what was, what's her temperature been the last 24 hours? Somewhere between 90 and 100? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> honey? That's how that goes. I mean, it's those little things that fill your plate, Mom. We understand. They fill your plate. And there's something special that God does for a, for a, for a mom. In closing, this picture of the gospel is a, really a story for all of us. Because this broken and sinful world that we're in, we're all on a journey, and every day, Beauty is farther behind us, and we're one step closer to the grave. That's the journey we're on. And it's painful. If you're lucky, you have people that, as luck exists. If you're blessed, you have people that are walking with you. And some of us have close friends. I, I do. I, I am blessed that way. I have close friends that there's... there's there's a group of us that we will be friends and close friends all of our life. And one at a time, we'll bury each other until there's only one left. We're all on that journey. And maybe we're going with people. But unless Jesus meets you at the proper, sovereign time, unless a group coming to comfort the death of this world and intervene and stop the procession toward the grave unless you meet him and you know who he is and hear his words 
rise up. Unless you meet him, that's your only destination. But when you meet him, his heart goes out to you. There is a day of a resurrection that's coming. We go through hard times, but there's a resurrection coming. We go through pain, but there's a resurrection coming. We go through brokenness and anger and bitterness and revenge and envy and jealousy and covetedness and adultery and, and we go through murder. We have to deal with all these things. But there is a day of resurrection coming. There is a day where all of the old will be gone and the new has come. Where he wipes every tear from our eye and he gives us a new eternal self, a new body. There is a day where Ian will run. There is a day where all this brokenness is gone. There is a resurrection day coming for all of us who trust in Christ. How could you turn that down? How could you be in that group of people leaving the beauty behind you, knowing you're headed toward the grave. And Jesus comes, and you turn away from him. How, how can you? He says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you would have life and have it abundantly. That's why Jesus came here, to meet us at just the right time that we would live forever. He offers you that. Most of us in the room, we've understood that. Lots of you in the room, remember that day where you crossed over, as John 5, 24 says, you crossed over from death to life. But if you've not got that squared away, why not? So I want to ask you, every person who has ever lived is in one of those two groups. You're a follower of Jesus, and wherever he leads, you go, and you're walking in the comfort and assurance of his love, his forgiveness, his grace. Or you're in the other group. And the only thing in front of you is bad, is death. Every person is in one of those two groups. The good news, when you meet him, after Jesus raised the boy and he gave him back to his mother, did they continue on to the cemetery? No. Jesus changed their entire direction. They probably followed him. Will you follow him? Will you give yourself to him? Not just once and check it off the list. Oh, I, got, I got saved when I was 17 and I got baptized the, the week after that. Check, I'm done. No, I'm talking about every moment of every, every breath. Mother's Day is once a year. No, Mother's Day is every moment of our lives to be grateful, as Mark said. So I challenge you in that. Reach out to him, accept the gift of eternal life, build your life on a firm foundation. Don't build it on the sand. When the storms come, it'll collapse. Jesus said he is the rock on which, he is the rock of our salvation, a firm foundation, that's who he is.